Hey guys, welcome to A Fistful of Dice. My name is Matt. And in this video, we're going to be talking about D&D 5th Edition, the basic rules. These are the basic rules that are free right now uh, via Wizards website. I'll put a link down in the description about um, these rules and uh, where you can get them. Um, so the rules are about, let's see here, there are 110 pages, I believe, including the, uh, the character sheet. Yeah, they're just over, just over 100, 105 pages. Um, so I've rolled up two or three characters with this rule set. I've read through it pretty thoroughly about two or three times, and I've ran one session with it so far. The session that I ran was uh, myself, um, my girlfriend, or fiance, Tila, um, who uh, has been playing for a couple of years, and a couple of friends of ours who have no real experience with D&D. I think um, one of them mentioned that he had played in one session, and he had some experience playing some other RPGs, but uh, was otherwise unexperienced with D&D. So I thought, what better way to test this new edition of D&D than with uh, an experienced player, a fairly experienced GM, and two people who have uh, you know little to no experience with, with Dungeons & Dragons. So I ran a little Dungeon Delve session that uh, had to do with dragons, so I wanted to fit a dungeon and some dragons into it. No actual live dragons, but the temple that they were in was dragon-themed. So they fought some kobolds, some skeletons, an animated suit of armor, and um, had to overcome some traps and solve a couple puzzles and riddles and stuff. So very just basic kind of uh, starter level dungeon. Nothing really too intense thrown at them. Uh, just kind of you know a fun little you know three four hour session. I really enjoy running the system. Uh, I haven't had a chance to play in it yet, but I'm going to. Uh, and I really like the character creation, uh, how it's laid out in the book. So um, I'm just going to kind of talk at the camera for a little bit about uh, D&D 5th Edition, what I like about it, what I don't. Um, and I'm just going to kind of list some pros and cons. And, you know, a lot of people have been asking me, is it worth it to switch to 5th Edition? I play Pathfinder. I play 4th Edition. I play, you know, AD&D. Is it worth it to, to get this stuff? And, um, you know, that's going to be for you to decide, man. It's it's free online. The basic rules are completely free online. The starter set's coming out here in about five days um, on online retailers for about 12 bucks. I know, on Amazon. So you have ample opportunity to check the system out for yourself and make that call after reading through it. But for what it's worth, here's my perspective. So stuff I like. Let's talk about stuff I like, and then we'll talk about stuff that I'm not so crazy about. So, um, immediately what springs to mind when I think about stuff I like about 5th edition is the backgrounds. And the backgrounds are essentially uh, a feature that your character gets at character creation that is represents what they were doing before they became an adventurer. So, who was your cleric before he was a cleric? Who was your fighter before he was a fighter? So on and so forth. And the backgrounds are things like criminal, acolyte, soldier, stuff like that. And they give you some skill bonuses and um, uh, some other stuff like that. But for the most part, the backgrounds are non-mechanical. Um, they give you these things called traits, bonds, ideals, and flaws. And these are completely unmechanical. They're not like feats. They don't give you bonuses or penalties. They simply give you tools that you can use to roleplay your character and generate your character's backstory, come up with your character's backstory and, and where they're from, where they're going, their goals, motivations, things like that. Um, so the traits are things like, um, you know, a character's personality, what's a quirk that they have, or something that they do on a regular basis. Are they really loyal? You know, um, do they judge people kind of harshly? Are they more into actions over words? Stuff like that. Um, the ideals are like 
their values, you know, honor, loyalty, greed, stuff like that. The bond is like a goal or something they're working towards or something that, you know, uh, they hold dear, an object, a person, a relationship. So a bond can be like, I want to bring glory to my hometown. A bond can be like, I want to learn everything there is to learn about magic, stuff like that. And then there's flaws, stuff that you 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 know might be a drawback for your character, a personality tick, um, something about them in their past, a secret that they're trying to outrun, an enemy out there looking for them, stuff like this. And the backgrounds to me really represent, like on a concrete level, wizards kind of uh, pushing more for role play, uh, pushing more for character-driven stories rather than action driving the plot. Having character drive the story. You know, all great stories are character driven. You don't have a good plot and throw characters in and expect it to work. You take good characters and the plot will work around them. So the backgrounds on that level really kind of represent uh, Watsy doing this. And I know reactions to backgrounds has been mixed. I've seen a few videos where guys are saying, you know, I don't like the backgrounds. I feel like Wizards is doing uh, my imagining for me. Or I feel like Wizards is, like, completely generating on-the-rails character for me. I don't agree with that at all. Um, I think you can use backgrounds or you can't. It's not essential uh, to the rules. Like I said, it gives you very little mechanical benefit outside of some skill proficiencies. Other than that, it's completely roleplay based. You can come up with your own backgrounds. You can come up with your own traits, bonds, ideals, and flaws. You can pick from lists and lists and lists of these things from the various backgrounds, mix and match really create the character you want to create. You can roll them randomly, you can hand pick them, you can create your own. So that the people who are complaining about it, I don't really get that because it's like complaining um, that a burger comes with tomato on it and you have to order it without tomato. It's like, just order it without tomato, dude. Quit bitching about it. That's what I feel like the backgrounds is. For people that want it, it's excellent. And for new players specifically, it was great because you have a new player who's sitting at the table and they're already a little overwhelmed by the whole experience and they're looking at this character sheet with all these numbers on it and they're like, I can't even begin to think about who this person is because I'm, I'm trying to learn this game. For that, the backgrounds are great because you have, you know, here's, an, here's some ideas for a character you could play. Here's an idea for all of their aspects of their personality. So that's, that's what I really like about the background system and uh, I really can't wait to see more backgrounds in the player's handbook that's going to be coming out here soon. Along those same lines, another thing I really like is the trinkets. Every character at level 1 gets to roll a trinket. And a trinket is basically like a, a random item that has no real use, but it's something you got to have to think about. So an example is like a pouch filled with human teeth, or um, a single dragon scale, or... Um, a bottle of griffin grease. You know, it's just like these random things that your character starts the game with, and you think, how did my character get this? What does it mean to them? Is it important to them? Is it an old family heirloom? Is it something they picked up from a stranger? Um, what does this mean to my character? Why do they have it? Again, it's just a tool for role play. It's putting more tools in your toolbox for you to use for your character. And, you know, it may not ever come up that your character has a dragon scale, you know, but you know, maybe they do. I rolled up a character, I rolled up a cleric, kind of randomly, just trying to trying to figure out the system, and I got the dragon scale. And from there, I came up with this entire pantheon. I decided that the dragon scale was, a, he wore it around his neck, his god was a dragon, um, and I kind of figured it out from there. You know, it's just these little seeds that you can use. You know, it's, it's kind of along those same lines where people are saying, you know, I don't like the background stuff, I don't like the trinkets because I feel like it's making my character for me. It's not. It's giving you seeds that you can kind of nurture and grow yourself. You know, it's up to you to make to make use of those things. The background stuff does you absolutely no good unless you do something with it. It actually requires a little bit more effort because you have to think creatively around those things and think about what do all these things mean together? What does that mean for my character? What kind of person is represented by this trait, this bond, this ideal, this flaw, this trinket. What do all of these things combined make? And you as a player have to think about that and come up with that. So I like that. 
Um, sub races. I like the sub races. I like that there's a little bit more variety, even though there's only four races in the basic rules, elf, human, halfling, and dwarf. Uh, all of the races except for humans have two sub races. So there's high elves and wood elves. There's uh, mountain dwarves and hill dwarves. And then there's lightfoot halflings and stout halflings. And all of those give you different benefits to your character and different features. And I really like that. I really like uh, having the sub races. And I hope that we'll see sub races for the other races that are coming up in the player's handbook. So like gnomes and half orcs and half elves. It'd be cool to see some other options for them as well um, that would give different features and a different flavor. That's really what it is. It's, it's a different flavor. You know, you've got your light foot halflings that are really, you know, light on their feet, dexterous and, you know, kind of roguey. And then you've got the stout halflings that are a little bit hardier, you know, kind of hobbity uh, kind of feeling. So I like the sub races. I like the mechanic of the proficiency bonus. The proficiency bonus is like your base attack bonus and your skill ranks all rolled up into one easy to use number. What the proficiency bonus does is it starts out at like a plus one or a plus two and it goes up every few levels and it basically just represents your character getting better at what they're good at. So um, you pick skill proficiencies at the beginning of the game and uh, you get to pick two with your class and then you get two with your background as well and basically when you roll those skills you not only add the ability modifier but you also add the proficiency bonus so that's just a really like slick kind of fluid way of doing skill ranks where you're not having to sit in there and apply you know skill points to every single skill you want to be good at you're just good at the ones you're good at and they, it automatically you automatically get better at it every few levels those are going up you know plus one plus two it also applies to attack bonuses, so like I said, it's like a base attack bonus. And then it also applies to saves that you're good at. So each class is really good at, or proficient at two saves. So like a, a cleric is wisdom and charisma. So when I roll a save that's a wisdom or a charisma save, not only do I add my wisdom and charisma modifier bonus, I also add the proficiency bonus. Um, so that's kind of a, just a really neat way of doing the 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 save bonuses that classes normally get in Dungeons and Dragons. Normally you go through and you see a rogue gets plus two at this level, plus three at this level for their dex bonus or reflex bonus or whatever. But the proficiency bonus is just a really nice universal way of increasing all of the stuff that needs to be increased as a result of leveling up and progressing through the game. So I really like the proficiency bonus. I think it's a really slick really easy way of doing that. I, I just think it's a really smart move uh, in terms of streamlining the game. Not necessarily simplifying, but streamlining, making it making it more streamlined and less clunky. Another thing I like, speaking of leveling up and pro progressing through the game, is the versatility of the spells. I feel like spells are much more versatile in D&D 5. There's not cantrips and level 1 spells and level 2 spells that become useless later on because um, spells get better the higher level you are. Certain spells. Certain spells. Um, so you'll have a spell that says heal this much uh, hit points or deal this much damage and then it'll say for every spell slot you use higher than this it goes up you know such and such much. So I can take a level 1 healing spell, and I can cast it as a level 5, and all of a sudden I'm healing a ton more uh, health. Or I can take a, a fireball spell and cast it at a higher level and do more damage, you know. It's a really uh, a cool way of saying, you know, I want to up the damage or I want to up the effectiveness of this spell. I'm just going to use it at a spell slot higher. So I'm going to eat up one of my level 7 spell slots here and cast this level 2 spell and have it be much, much more effective. Uh, and just in general, I feel like the spells are just more effective. Um, we had a wizard in our party uh, and a cleric in our party in the session that I ran, and they were just tearing through stuff with their spells, man, but they, they didn't feel invincible. That's, that's the good thing, is that uh, I almost had a total party kill, and I was using monster stats from the playtest, which means their HP was really low, and their damage output was really low, and I was still almost... I was just tearing through this party, and we actually had one person almost die another person go unconscious and get stabilized. So it is it is still deadly. It's deadlier than, than third and fourth, I feel. It's easier for characters to die. So 
I, that's just my that's just my feeling so far. Um, and then also on spell versatility to go back to that um, the idea of rituals. There are certain spells you can cast as rituals. They take about ten minutes and um, they don't eat up a spell slot. So you can if you have time to sit there and cast tech magic for ten minutes, it doesn't eat up your level one spell slot. That's really cool. I like that. It makes spells more versatile, more usable, easier. Um, I like features that are less mechanical, uh, that give you uh, fewer mechanical benefits. So it's things like um, the criminal background has a thing called criminal contact, which is basically you get to come up with a way that you can contact the criminal other underground, whether it be a fence that you sell stuff to, special code, um, you know, a place you go to meet somebody, really kind of a cool thing. And then another uh, example is the uh, cleric's divine intervention ability. At a certain level, clerics can attempt to contact their god directly. And there's like a very slim chance that it's going to work, but it's still there. And so it's like this this feature doesn't give you any mechanical benefits. It doesn't increase any skills. It doesn't give you a feat. It doesn't give you something new you can do in combat. It gives you just a cool role play thing that you can kind of devise and use as you see fit. And I love seeing non-mechanical features like this. I love seeing stuff that's kind of open to interpretation and up to the DM to decide how it's going to go and how it plays out. So I like seeing stuff like that. Uh, in general, I feel like it's less finicky. There are fewer numbers, like I, like I was talking about with the proficiency bonus. Um, attributes are even more important in this because there are less modifications going into skills and saving throws, so your attributes really just are the beginning and the end of your stats. Um, so they're much more important, and that also makes things a lot easier when it comes to rolling. Um, I also like that they got rid of the crit range and crit threat. So all everything crits at 20, and there's no roll to confirm critical hits. That's awesome. That was my least favorite thing about 3rd edition and 4th edition was the crit range and the crit threat. I like everything to just crit the same at level 20, do double damage, and no re-rolling crap. On that same note, combat feels a lot more fluid. I don't know, I don't really know what it was specifically that makes combat seem more fluid. It might just be that it's less finicky, that there's fewer numbers. Things like I was talking about where you aren't rolling twice to crit, where you, um, you know, you aren't making all of this extra, extra, extra rolls and extra numbers and stuff. Combat feels very fluid and fast. You know, we were rolling through these combats. I rolled a, or I played a, a ran a three or four hour session with three or four combats in it. And I mean, the combats didn't eat up that much time. They felt very quick. At the same time, they don't lose out on any of the the quality of it. You know, you still feel like you're in this in this battle. You're still strategizing and thinking and being creative and kind of working together, but it's just not as clunky. You're not worrying so much about attacks of opportunity. They exist, but they're easier to avoid easier to avoid. You know, you're not worrying so much about spells getting interrupted and, you know, uh, shooting ranged weapons in combat, things like that. There's just fewer clunky, kind of unnecessary rules in combat, and I really enjoyed running combat, and I think everybody playing really enjoyed it as well. Uh, another thing I like, I love the advantage-disadvantage system. I think it is one of the coolest things to come out of Dungeons & Dragons uh, in recent memory. If you don't know, the advantage-disadvantage system is if you have an advantage, you roll 2d20s, take the higher result. If you have disadvantage, you roll 2d20s, take the lower result. There are certain abilities and spells that will give you advantage. Uh, certain races and classes have features that will give you advantage towards certain things. For example, uh, halflings get advantage against uh, fear. So if they're making a, you know, uh, a wisdom saving throw against fear, they're going to roll 2d20s and take the higher result. But it's also a really easy way for the DM to just dictate if you have advantage in a situation. If you role play really well as you're trying to intimidate somebody, guess what? You get advantage on that intimidation roll. Somebody's trying to help you move something, guess what? You get intimidation on your strength check, or intimidation. You get advantage on your strength check. Um, you did something really cool in combat, you jumped off of something and you're flying at this goblin with your sword and you're screaming in the air, guess what? Advantage on that attack because you described it really cool and that's awesome. So it's just a really easy way for the for the DM to say, you know, uh, you have the uh, you, you uh, an advantage in this situation. You're doing really good in this situation. You're role-playing really well. 
I'm going to give you advantage on this roll. On those same lines, the inspiration system. Uh, you can give players inspiration points that they can use to give themselves advantage. And an, an example of what you would give your player an inspiration point is like, uh, the character has a certain flaw uh, that they rolled on their background, and, all, and they're exemplifying that. They're playing up that. You say, you know what, you're doing a really good job playing up your background choices. I'm going to give you an inspiration point. You can use that whenever you want to give yourself advantage on a roll. I've been doing this for years. I call it the fate chip system. Whenever someone does something cool like that, in character, being creative, thinking outside the box, I hand them a poker chip, and they can turn that poker chip in to roll 2d20s and take the higher result. I've been doing that for years, and to see it in a D&D game is just awesome. I love the inspiration point system. So now let's talk about stuff I'm not so crazy about. <clears throat> so the basic rules, there's no monster stats and there's no magic items. Um, it's easy enough to delve into the playtest to get monster stats and magic items, but there are adjustments that need to be made. And I honestly feel like uh, having, a, having a rule system come out that you're expecting people to run a game with, not having monster stats, is kind of weird. Like, even just having a few monsters, you know, having goblin, skeleton, maybe a gelatinous cube or something in there, would be great. But they're waiting until... Um, nearer when the monster manual, the player's handbook, dungeon master guide comes out before they add monsters into the basic rules. I'm not super positive when they're going to be adding monster rules. I'm pretty sure it's in August, but um, until then you're going to have to delve into the play tests or grab monster stats out of the starter set, which is what I ended up doing, or whatever. Uh, so that's kind of a bummer. Another thing I don't like is how they've ordered character creation. How they have it uh, um, laid out is you pick your race, then your class, then you roll your stats, then you pick your background. It's really kind of backwards to me. Your background should be, your background and your race should be the first things you're picking. So here's how I recommend rolling up a character in D&D 5. Roll your stats or pick your stats, then pick your race, assign your racial bonuses, get your racial features, then pick your background, then pick your class. That makes sense. You're born a certain race, you have certain physical and mental abilities, you have your background, what you were doing before your adventure, and then you become an adventurer, you pick your class. I just feel like that's common sense, but they have it kind of completely backwards, laid out in the rule book. It doesn't really matter in what order you do it in, so I would just recommend do it the way I just described. Stats, race, background, class. That's how I would do it. Um, another thing I'm not super into is the way they've described spellcasting for clerics and wizards. Um, I've been playing Dungeons and Dragons and its offshoots for years, and even I was a little bit confused about spells known versus spells prepared versus spell slots. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be simpler, but it just needs to be explained better. It took me a few times reading through it, and a few characters rolled up before I understood what the difference was between known spells, prepared spells, and spell slots. Um, specifically, the different ways that wizards and clerics uh, kind of do it. And after I read through it a few times, I realized it's kind of the same way it's always been, but the way they describe it is just kind of weird. So I would just kind of make sure you read through that and understand that you make sure that you understand it. Uh, the difference between the spells you know, the spells you prepared, and the number of spell slots you have per day. So, Other than that, there hasn't been much that's come up that I don't like about D&D 5th edition. It's really too early to tell. Again, I've only, you know, I just, I just read through the rules two or three times. I've uh, DM'd one session, and I've rolled up a few characters. But... I can say from that experience, from, you know, the few dozen hours I've put into this so far, it is a really, really good system. It is, and I'm not just saying that, it is a solid system that can compete with Pathfinder, with Numenera, with Savage Worlds. It can compete with those on its merits alone not even counting the fact that it's Dungeons and Dragons. I feel like a lot of people are just like, well, people only like it because it's D&D, &D, and people will just eat up whatever they put out. 
that's simply not true because we saw what happened with fourth edition. You know, people weren't too crazy about fourth edition, and you know, they kind of canned fourth edition a little bit earlier because of that. But fifth edition is probably my favorite edition of Dungeons and Dragons and its offshoots since third edition, and I almost kind of like it more than third edition. And I know I'm going to get hung, drawn, and quartered for that. But just this is just from my limited experience with it, with running it, with rolling up characters, with reading through the rules. This is a really slick system. It gives the DM lots of tools. It gives players lots of tools, which is, to me, the most important thing. It gives players lots of tools with which they can build their characters and role play. Um, so to the people that have been asking me, is D&D &D 5 worth it? Should I switch? Should I buy the starter set? I don't know. I really like it, and I'm going to continue running it and continue playing in it. Is it going to become my main system? I don't know. Um, I'm not sure yet. That remains to be seen, but I am going to keep up with the releases. I'm going to keep up with these books, and I hope that this shapes up to be a long-lasting Dungeons & Dragons rule set. So if you are interested, based on my recommendation, in checking this system out, you can follow the link below to look at the basic rules PDF. It's completely free, and it lays out everything from character creation to running a game to combat to equipment, everything, except for monster stats and magic items. But I would definitely, re definitely recommend checking out Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. It's... Um, it's a really slick system, man. I'm, I've really been enjoying it. So um, I'll keep up with my uh, thoughts on the matter, keeping up with the releases of the books and stuff. But um, yeah, that's going to be it for me, guys. Hope everyone's doing well. Take care. Happy gaming all.